I was actually fortunate one time, a very, very long time ago when I was getting started in my DJ career, quote unquote, maybe in like 20, 2008, actually, 2008, maybe 2008, I think around that time, 2008, 2010, I DJed at some like art gallery thing and I had my DJ controller with me. This was back in the day when having a DJ controller was like a red, was like a scarlet letter. It was almost like you were an amateur, like you didn't know how to play, but it was the only way I could actually have the ability to play music, right? Out out, and out in public and be able to DJ and shit. So I didn't have the ability to have CDJs because it was too much money. So I had this Newmark MIDI controller, right? DJ MIDI controller that I kind of used and took out to me, took out with me when I was playing. And um, I, I went to go play this gig where I was playing, I think I had an art gallery or somewhere, and Crystal Clear also played after me which is fucking funny when you think about it, right? I was on the same fucking lineup as Crystal Clear, but I was at one fucking point. So that's pretty cool to fucking see him now becoming this world touring superstar DJ producer guy who recently put out a book of photography, which he also kind of dabbles in of all the kind of people he bumps into and he's friends with out there in nightlife. But he penned this interesting article courtesy of the Irish Independent talking about one of my favourite clubs, the Berghain. So I thought, why not talk about this? Because this is a really interesting article because it features one of my favourite digital artists and also one of my favourite clubs in the world and places to be, which is Berghain. So the title of the article is follows, courtesy of the Irish Independent. I did my Berghain set then, had to leave straight away to play Kate Moss's 40th in London. Crystal clear on what happens when the party ends. So, let's hear what Crystal Clear has to say. When we hear the term international DJ, most of us probably imagine an endless summer of rev uh, red velvet ropes, riders, after parties, after after parties, with jet set hedonism, sweaty, euphoric dance floors, and DJ booths full of beautiful people. Well, that's how it looks on Instagram, and it does. And it actually is like that in real life. That's the, f that's the fucked up shit about DJing, I think. As much as I've like, you know, been pursuing it myself as a kind of quote unquote career and I've been involved in the industry or I've been involved, at, you know, kind of doing my own parties and whatever it may be and just being involved in the scene and shit, right? The unfortunate nature of it is that I can now have way more sympathy for people who crash out, who end up kind of like succumbing to addiction, who end up unfortunately passing away, wherever it may be, because I've seen what it actually is like on the inside. And it unfortunately is as good as it sounds if you're into that sort of stuff, right? There's loads of drugs available, loads of drinks available, loads of access flowing around the world, women, men, everyone in between that you're into, it's all available to you. You just have to know how to kind of, you know, do it in moderation. But if you don't want to do it in moderation, you want to go, you know, balls deep, you can go balls deep. But unfortunately, sometimes you can get lost in the source. And when you're lost in the source, there's no coming back. Anyway, the article continues. The truth says Dublin born DJ. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. The truth is, um, Dub says Dublin born DJ and music producer Ducklin Lennon, aka Kristen Crystal Clear, is that the immense highs of touring lifestyle often come with extreme lows. It looks like a never ending party on social media here agrees, but nobody really talks about the loneliness, exhaustion, burnout often goes hand in hand with the schedule, which is the, obviously the sad part of it. Because you can imagine, as a DJ, you're basically one person. You don't need your manager with you. You don't need your agent with you. You don't need your marketing team with you. You don't need anybody. You just need a pair of headphones and a USB key, right? That's all you need. A pair of headphones and USB stick or maybe a laptop. That's it. Nothing else is needed. You spend most of your time in your hotel prior to the gig because you want to search for last minute tunes or you go to, you know, or maybe you're in the hotel waiting for someone to pick you up to go for dinner. But you don't really go and explore the city. You have you don't have time. You're flying in just before the set starts. Um, you're flying out after the set finishes. So you're a bit all over the place. And obviously that kind of lifestyle, the same way as, because that's the thing with DJing, I'd imagine similar to like being a raver. When you're, when you're a raver, quote unquote, you get a lot of lifestyle shaming from other people. I've noticed that as well, especially the older I've got over like, over time. I've noticed a lot more people kind of like lifestyle shaming you because people, when they, when they get over partying and being a party person, um, it's a big departure from their regular life. And also they can sometimes, no, let me, let me, let, let me walk that back. In general, when people try and lifestyle shame you, it almost feels a little bit harder to kind of handle 
because you know technically you're not on the same timeline or timetable as them because you're sometimes going out late on a Friday you're coming back early morning on a Sunday and most regular people don't what well, don't want to do that right if you're not into the party lifestyle you're probably looking for other things to do during the weekend so you can only imagine what that must be like as a DJ it's probably tenfold because maybe during the week your week's already fucked up maybe you're you're free on like a Wednesday at 4 p.m most people are working around that sort of time. So it can be a little bit of a fucked up situation to be in because you sometimes can only hang out with raving people, but raving people are a bad influence and you cannot hang out with your regular friends because all your regular friends are actually working real important jobs. It continues. The intensity of touring lifestyle can be destructive, he says. It was for him. In July 2023, Lennon had a nervous breakdown at an airport in Nice. He had just performed nine shows around the world in 11 days with a crazy travel schedule for the last two. I collapsed at security, repeating the same sentence, crying non-stop, completely out of battery, um, uh, battery oil on the brain. Or to the brain, sorry. I was completely on my own. The loneliness of the lifestyle was intensified by the sleep deprivation, amplified by the fact that one person I wanted to call about it was gone. She had split up with me. I was just in a really bad place. Fuck. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine being on a flight to Nice to play in some random fucking club somewhere no one outside of Nice fucking knows about? That's the thing about being a DJ too. You get these amazing gigs, but you also get a lot of gigs. So you end up playing sometimes these random places. Maybe there's no one even... Maybe you go... All that you got all that hassle to fly from Ibiza to Madrid to Berlin to Luxembourg to fucking Nice. You get to fucking Nice and there's ten people there, right? So all that effort to go to this event, you're obviously getting paid handsomely. Well, fair enough, but no one's fucking there. So you're kind of pissed off at the promoter for not promoting it well. You then start to get a bit insecure about yourself, thinking shit, am I just not that big of a deal? People don't want to see me, and you start wasting your time. You start having a bit of a existential crisis, and then you're crying. You're crying at an airport. You break down and sob at an airport because of the loneliness of your career and almost because you've been trapped by these fucking golden handcuffs. And I would imagine as well, there's a weird mindfuck because sometimes, I know for me anyway, right? The one thing that you want as an up and coming DJ is gigs. I'm playing this weekend and, you know, at a pub somewhere near where I live, um, you know, for like a regular sort of like thing that I do all the time. But, you also want like proper gigs playing in actual proper nightclubs. That's all you want as a DJ. You want an opportunity to prove yourself and to get more gigs. Then you get more gigs and it becomes the worst thing ever because now you can't seem to keep out of that rabbit world, right? You kind of want to keep spinning. The money's good. The lifestyle's quite cool. But then it also kind of isolates you from regular people. It fucks up your friendships. It fucks up your relationship with your family, with your relationship with other people. Like, you know, like I think of, I think Seth Trox was another one too, who had a similar situation where he he basically had, um, he lost a fiance off the back of his kind of ascent from going to be like a, you know, a, a kind of tech house, minimal house kind of superstar type of thing. You do pay a big price, but I have to be honest, part of me feels like a lot of this moaning that DJs do about the lifestyle is like a weird type of thing to almost make themselves feel relatable to the public because i feel like really and truly you know you know what it is when you get into it you know wagwan you know exactly what it's going to be like especially if you're crystal clear you produce amazing work yeah he's he's production he's one of the rare djs who's as good as the producer as he's a dj he's super high level in both fields but we all know if you make a banging tune you're going to increase the amount of bookings that you're going to get. You're going to become more, more famous. You're going to be more in demand. You're just going to be everywhere and everywhere at all times. So you know what comes with making a hit. You know what comes with pursuing your career. You know what comes with being a, a, a really good at your job. It is, part and part, it is part and parcel of that kind of journey. So some of the complaints, some of the moaning and shit, it can almost feel a little bit, you know, like I said, like a weird way to kind of, almost feign relatability to the public if that makes sense i don't know if this makes sense it kind of makes sense in my head it continues declan um aka crystal clear is a dj music producer from dublin he also runs a label called cold tonic and is about to bring out his first book building walls out without paper building walls out of paper sorry london uk february da, da, da. um lennon describes his mental health in the moments um sorry lennon describes his mental health in the months leading up to his incident as a slow burning fuse that eventually blew by the way i also think the term or the categorization or the you know the overall the overarching term of mental health has been incredibly overused i, I want to get to the point where people are 
getting diagnosed before they say they have anxiety or have depression until you get diagnosed i don't want to hear your you know self-diagnosed assessment of your fucking mental health i don't give a fuck but in this regard i think this is really important let's continue the hardest part was long before that he says chatting by phone from his home in london when i first moved here i remember sitting in my flat surrounded by boxes just sitting on the floor thinking i'm not happy nothing oh okay now i get him now i get crystal clear he's talking about london my hometown of course london makes you depressed london is one of those places where it's not spontaneous people are very individual individualistic um there isn't much of a community outside of going to pubs and clubs and drinking and doing drugs um people are kind of like i said on their own island very clicky it can be a very lonely place even if you got money if you got clout, if you got fame, it's not a very fun place for adults to do adult things outside of drinking and doing drugs. Honestly, London, if you don't do drugs, if you don't drink, it's kind of boring. I'm not going to lie. So I'm not surprised that an international DJ who spends all his time on his flights on his own, playing on his own, in hotels on his own, then lives in London and discovers, oh shit, I'm in this amazing flat on my own. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm not surprised. It continues. He tried to get excited about the upcoming tour, but I just remember that nothing will cheer me up. Ultimately, my lifestyle from the end of 2002 started to labor on me and my mental health. I started to get more and more sleep deprived. I fell into a bit of a dark hole about a lot of things in the beginning of the year. And unfortunately, I went on tour for eight weeks, came back and the woman that I loved split up with me because she felt like she wasn't getting what she wanted. She was fair. She was completely fair. I was like a ghost for two months, mentally at least. Yo, can you imagine? I can't imagine. I can't imagine being able to leave my wife and kids for eight weeks for any job that's the weird thing about a dj job i think dj unfortunately as a career has to be a red flag for a lot of women or anyone in, in particular men or whoever you're into has to be a red flag because that's the type of job that in the same way of like working on an oil rig because i think that no an oil rig is different if you work on an oil rig you have a a, a set amount of time that you're going to be there couple of months, nine months, whatever, and then you're not there again. But DJ lifestyle is, is year round, especially nowadays. Nowadays, we have festivals that start in the 1st of January. So if technically, if you want to, you can play all year fucking round if you want to. If you have the stamina, if you have the endurance, if your heart is okay, if your nostrils aren't fucked up, you can play all year round if you want to. Can you imagine leaving your family and kids for eight weeks and still finding them when you get back? never especially the especially the type of women that i'm into and shit the the nubian queens out there they would never let me get away with leaving for eight weeks and then coming like and then coming back like everything's okay texting them at 2 a.m only at four, like come on man like and think about it as a as a dude think about it as a dude <clears throat> forget black or white think about it as a guy you're a dj and you're away for eight weeks what do you do on your social media do you post on Instagram stories? Do you post all your meals? Do you post hanging out with all these cool people in different cities? Do you post all the fan love? Do you post all the booth pictures? Do you post that knowing full well your missus or wife is at home just looking at that angry, angry, furious? Or do you have to hide that you're having fun? You have to pretend you're not, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, what do you do? What do you do when you're in that situation? Do you upload pictures? Do you not upload pictures? Like, how do you make that work? oh <laughs> she'll be so pissed you're in like some you're in paris having this amazing steak dinner with red wine you're getting taken out by chauffeurs you're meeting the fucking party promoters having this amazing part have amazing dinner like last supper vibes on this big table everyone is cheering your name a fan comes up to you at the at the gig and gives you this massive teddy bear. Some hot girl tells you to fucking sign her tits or takes a picture with you and tags you. Your missus sees that on your Instagram because you reshared it. Shit, you know what I mean? I can I can't imagine the amount of divorces that have happened in the DJ world. It must be fucking crazy. Let's continue. Uh, ba ba ba. It was a tough time, but the show had to go on. Even if Lennon was there, more embodied and in spirit. 
He remembers playing back to back with his friend and mentor Gerd Jansen. Big up Gerd Jansen, one of the best DJs in the world, one of my favorite DJs in the world. Big up running back, big up Gerd Jansen, fucking G. I've seen him play many times. Last time I seen him play actually was at Panorama Bar. I said hi to him after the set, and he was fucking lovely. So big up Gerd Jansen. Um, his best friend and mentor Gerd Jansen at Circo Loco, DC Ten and Ibiza on the Monday before his breakdown. Getting booked for Circo Loco is a big deal. Especially when you're given one of the peak slots, as Lennon and Jansen were. It should have been a career high for Lennon, but his head was elsewhere. At the dinner beforehand, I was just pre I, I really want to go to DJ dinner, by the way. That's one thing that I can't wait to do once my DJ career starts to blossom, because I know I'm going to be there soon. Soon, one day, you're going to hear me on this fucking pod say, Oh my God, guys, I've got books to play at Burkai and I've got books to play at Paramount. But you're going to hear me say that one day. But one of the things I'm really looking forward to is the fucking DJ dinner. Sitting down with the promoters, everyone kind of sucking your dick, giving you a hand job underneath the fucking table, right? Slipping you fucking little baggies of eight balls and shit. Like, here you go, mate. Right? Don't worry, you're gonna get your ten grand. But here's also a little eight ball just to kind of keep you keep you going, right? You gonna tell you? Hey, by the way, look, give you a little wink. Say that we, we, we got we got a room full of Romanians up there, right? All all of age, by the way, right? Room full of Romanians upstairs, all of age for you, mate, to knock down. Don't worry, you know, keep your phones in the fucking safe. <laughs> That's what I'm looking forward to. That's what I'm looking forward to, man. You know what I mean? Eight balls at dinner, right? Steak dinner on the promoters, right? Couple of grand in the fucking bank account for playing an hour, right? Because now, because I was, I was just thinking about it the other day. Like, I wonder I wonder how long I'm going to be on 150. Cause that's my, that's the, that's my current rate at the moment. My current rate at the moment as a DJ is 150 pounds, right? And it's for f like four hours as well. It's not even for like an hour. So I wonder how long am I going to be on a 150 rate? When will I get to like a thousand pounds for like an hour set? Like some of these big DJs or like even like 10 grand for fucking half an hour. I wonder how long it's going to be for me. Or like, or will I be on 150 for four hours for like seven years more? I don't know. Either way, let's continue. Um... So it says, at the dinner before, and I wasn't particularly myself, I remember Gerd, um, I remember Gerd and I arriving at, at DC 10, and I remember pulling him aside. I never get anxious for gigs, and I told him, I'm really anxious. I'm just not feeling in, in control. Jesus Christ, bro. Um, he asked why. I said, I just got a long, I just got a lot going on in my mind, and I feel like I'm vacant now. He said, don't worry, and he looked after me. But I remember that was a prime, ex that's a very German way of response, isn't it? Very German, isn't it? Very German. Why? But why? Don't worry, I'll look after you. Now that, that sounds kind of Indian, but you know, the, you know the accent, right? Germans are very uh, matter of fact, cold. Yeah, you know I mean, no niceties and shit, no pleasantries, right? Why? Don't worry, I'll look after you. Don't worry, I have your back. Big up, Gerd Jensen. Um, he said, "Don't worry," and he looked after me. But I remember that I was, it was a prime example of me thinking I've got to bury myself with booze. Absolutely have because it's such a big gig. DC10 is quite intense environmental, uh, sorry, it's, it's quite an intense environment, he says, in a good way, of course. And as you guys know, DC10 is like, you know, you know obviously like Bifa, and it's, obviously, it's a place where it's usually just packed full of fucking dudes, and there's dudes on the dance floor everywhere, there's dudes in the booth everywhere, but that's part of the vibe of it, right? It's almost just really, it's, kind of, it's almost like a clubhouse type of vibe. Everyone's kind of packed into each other like sardines and shit, but it kind of looks like a bit like a vibe. I'd actually love to go just to kind of witness it as a punter, as opposed to DJing first. I'd to see what it kind of looks like, because it must be quite sick to see, because the DJ booth is a bit on a, it's kind of like on a platform a little bit, and to like an angle, and it's open air too, so you can see kind of planes going above you. It's quite sick, actually, as a, as a club, not going to lie. Um, DC10 is quite an intense environment, he says, in a good way, of course. And you're here going, I've got to make sure I perform. This is a world stage. Knowing I couldn't be in a moment at all was a real telltale sign that something wasn't right. I knew then that I couldn't shut off from the upset I was feeling inside of my heart and inside of my head. That's the thing, though, isn't it? When you've got actual real life shit going on, the DJing stuff becomes almost trivial. Like, when your fiancé has broke up with you, when your long-term girlfriend has left you and shit, or you know most likely when you go back home she's not going to be there, almost the whole DJing thing becomes like, what does, what does this fucking matter? Do you know what I mean? Who gives a fuck about this shit? Um, Lennon now wishes that he had opened up more about what he was going through. When you start to think, shit, I'm feeling some heavy stuff, that's when you start to fear that people will want your company. Will not want your company. The same way our colleagues don't want to hang out with sober people. It is, it's the same vein. Huh. Is that true? 
I wonder if that's specific to the DJ world. I wonder if, the, if in the DJ world, if you talk about your mental health struggles, or if you talk about your issues or your struggles with sobriety, maybe people kind of feel like you're going to be a bit of a party pooper. Is that what people maybe think? That's wild, it's true, isn't it? That maybe does show you how toxic nightlife industry is or nightlife scene is, that people will actually be a little bit turned off by hanging out with you because they feel like you might be a bit of a Debbie Downer and you might start crying on their shoulder and shit and they don't want that. Fucking hell. Um, with my friends, I didn't want to be the moany prick in the group and I was conscious of my girlfriend who was younger than me. I didn't want her to be like, God, I'm dating this older guy who's got all these problems. I better run away. Ah, uh, yeah, okay, cool. See, that's also another reason why you'd imagine, you know, the relationship didn't work out. If you're a DJ and you're older than the lady and she's still got her whole life ahead of you and you're doing your career shit, it's almost impossible for that shit to work out. You'd imagine the only way it would probably work out is if you were probably the similar age or at a similar stage in life. Forget the age, just in where you are in life in terms of actually having a career that you're kind of, you know, stay you know somewhat stable in you it's something you're going to be doing for the long term so that you can kind of you know negotiate and build a future to get no, negotiate or you know figure out how to kind of handle your relationship and then kind of figure out how ways to kind of put things to put in place to ensure that you guys can kind of last for the long term you'd imagine but again i'm a relationship expert i don't know what i'm talking about i'm a fucking idiot let's continue if i had told people more people and spoke to my ex and said, listen, I'm having a tough time mentally. They had been giving me some good advice. She would maybe had thought, shit, it's naturally going through it. This is not about us. Yeah, but I don't think that's the case. I don't think you can convince people not to break up with you, even if you've got issues. I think when they're tapped out, they're tapped out. I think that's that's the thing about breakups. They're quite selfish in that regard. They don't You don't really consider other people's feelings. You're mostly considering your feelings and how you are in that, in that time and place and whatnot and what the relationship is like for you. You're not thinking about the other person. So as much as you're saying this, I don't think it would have helped. The fact that she was out, she was out. Do you know what I mean? I don't think that, nothing would have changed that, unfortunately for him. It continues. Now he wants to be open um, about what he went through in the hope that it might help someone else feel a little bit less alone. A few days after the incident in Nice, while recovering in his home in London, Lennon posted a story on Instagram. He said on Monday, the four, the four walls of my professional and personal life collapsed um, and heavy uh, after a heavy run of shows, I was riding the lightning and it caught me. It was, uh, it was, silly, it was, a, it was a serenely honest post. I probably wouldn't have posted it if I, was, if I had waited a week, but it was on my mind so much. I think there was an element of empathy that can get lost because of social media and you're thinking at the lack of back of your mind, this isn't their business. Let them get back to liking memes and funny videos. They don't need to know what's going on in my head. But at the time, I felt nobody knows this. Nobody knows this is going on. Nobody knows this is reality of my situation or my lifestyle. Everyone assumes it's fucking brilliant. And, I'm, and I was saying that it was fucked up. Now, the situation is, like I said before, is that I think everybody goes through this. Especially as DJs, I think this is a common thing. People just probably keep a lid on it because, you know, it probably happens too often. But I do think as well, there is too much of this. There was a whole account, I think, on social media of people saying, oh, DJ's complaining, right? And it'll be the most, like, trivial shit about connecting flights, about not having Wi-Fi, like, all this dumb shit. So I think in general, considering how difficult this career is, most of you would know, you know, being a DJ is one of the hardest jobs in the world because it's one of the most in-demand jobs in the world and there aren't just, there aren't many opportunities going around. There's way more DJs than there are opportunities, especially in a place like the UK, especially in a place like London, especially in a place like Europe. There's just too many DJs, not enough opportunities. So when you do finally get in, you have to know that if you are one of the lucky chosen few, that you're going to be one of the lucky chosen few that's going to be spread across all the events, which is why most of the big events have the same people playing again and again, because those are the ones that can guarantee a crowd. Those are the ones that can sell tickets. Those are the ones that well known. Those ones that are trusted. Blah, 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 blah. So this side of the... This, this kind of stress or whatever, the schedule, is a consequence or is a part of the job. You know what I mean? It is what it is. You can't separate the two. You can't be a famous world touring dj without this it's just what comes of it you just have to work out a way to handle it a way to manage it um a way to make it work basically there is no way to kind of fix it the industry is fucked up um it is what it is it's broken it's not gonna get fixed anytime soon there's festivals literally like i said from january all the way to december 31st so if you want to play all year round you can but of course your mental your physical your family your personal will obviously suffer and that is the nature of the beast it kind of just is what it is um 
So when I hear some of these complaints, sometimes I'm a little bit like, yeah, but you don't really want to go back to playing at art gallery after you don't. He, he, I'm sure Crystal Clear doesn't want to be playing at these at the private view at the art exhibition private views that he was playing at when I was when I met him back in the day. I, I'm sure he doesn't want to come back to that level where you're getting fifty the pounds or a couple of drinks <laughs> to play in the corner of an art gallery where no one fucking gives a shit that you're there. Do you know what I mean? So. You know, it is what it is. It continues. Um, He's very aware of his privilege. I'm willing to take the risk of having rocks held at me. Oh, man, get off your high horse. You've got such a great life. I just felt it's important, at least for me, for those that know this lifestyle is misconstrued. And it's generally misconstrued, ironically, through this app that I'm posting on. I don't think that's true, though. I don't think every. I don't think people think it's misconstrued. It's not at all. I think everybody knows the reality situation. They know, they know that being a professional dj is fraught with landmines right it's a very um it's an occupational hazard right for lack of a better term people know that but they're willing to roll the dice because it is a great lifestyle and if it's actually if that's your dream if that's your passion like it is for me to like play music loudly and share my in you know my kind of my taste with people and make them dance and make them forget all their worries and have a good time whatever and make them sweat and boogie and maybe fall in love and make new friends on the dance floor that's an, that that you're willing to kind of you're willing you know the positives sort of like outweigh the negatives in that regard but you know negatives do exist but i don't think it's misconstrued in the slice i don't think people think it's all sunshine and rainbows i'm sure people are aware myself included that most of those gigs especially some of the big DJs on the lineup that you see while touring you look at their fucking list of gigs on ra and for sure there's going to be some gigs on there regardless of where they are in the world whether they're in guatemala whether they're in fucking prague and shit there's going to be some gigs where there's going to be no one turning up they might be playing a gig where there's like 10 people in the fucking audience. That's part of being a DJ, right? There might be a gig where you arrive late and, you know, and you have no option but to play for like 20 minutes and you get docked your wages or some shit. Like that shit happens. We know. We know what, what the situation is. We know sometimes being a DJ, it kind of costs you your family, costs your relationship, your marriage. It kind of is part of the fucking the devil's bargain that you kind of take when obviously you kind of agree to become or you know you, you you kind of ascend to that kind of level but i don't think it's misconstrued personally for me i don't think it's misconstrued but i could be wrong it continues i always feel a little bit guilty about feeling upset or sad he continues i've got a roof over my head money in my pocket food on my plate and i don't have to shovel coal every day in the rain i'm extremely fortunate but yeah the touring lifestyle is completely unknown Unest underestimated for those who haven't done it and it's definitely a bit of an age kicking in i'm i'm not old by any means but i'm not 25 anymore that's the thing though that's why i think as a dj at his level he should now become somebody that takes his his, his career and he's so he should be a dj that takes his career in he's in control right of his own hands like it should be he should he should be dictating what gigs he plays he should be like uh you know like a dixon when they're like oh i'm only gonna do 100 gigs of course that comes from a place of privilege because dixon and all those innovation guys are super in demand so you can sort of like decide what gigs you can and can take maybe there are some djs who are quote-unquote working class blue collar djs who have to take everything they're gonna be given at them or thrown at them but i think if you're someone like a crystal clear and you're clearly suffering and you have the ability to break down and you're going through all these hard moments in your life both professionally both personally you probably should um prioritize your mental health and your you know your overall kind of you know um, happiness as opposed to getting all the gig big gigs and be able to charge as much as you want to charge maybe limited amount of gigs that you're doing and um, maybe pick the places that you're going to play with more intention and then kind of go from there but you can't you know complain about the schedule and they keep doing the same thing you know what i mean it's a bit dumb in my personal opinion but what do i know let's continue um at first, especially when you're when you're advancing of, of in years you definitely have to be a little bit more purposeful about what gigs you do do and which gigs you don't do but again i could be wrong at 36 lennon has got a lot of living to do but he's also been in the game for a long he's 36 right he looks a lot older than that to be honest um i thought he's 40s um he's also been in the game a long time having got his first set of turntables at 10 years 16 music loomed large in his life from the young age he went to school at st michael's college in Boardsbridge in dublin but was more interested in graffiti writing and hanging out with record shops i was very lucky he says i grew up in a very eclectic father he was a dj when he was younger and he was very open to me exploring my any album i wanted his older cousin john joe was another big influence he to me was the epitome of cool so i was taking whatever nuggets he could share whether it was a dj shadow 
Shadow or Deftones and it just turned into a giant stew between 11 to 14. Hey, giant stew. Big up Brendan Shaw. A giant stew. Giant stew. My ears were tantalized by nearly everything I heard. At 15, he joined a metal band. We were we were god awful, but then his interest in electronic music started to completely eclipse whatever I was listening to. One of the first techno gigs he ever attended was DJ Dave Clark. Oh, big up Dave Clark, man. One of the best moaners. One of the best whingers on social media. A great follower on fucking Facebook, actually. And weirdly enough, a fucking killer DJ. I saw him play maybe, let's say, six months ago in fucking Fabric. So good. That's the thing. He's one. He's one. He's one of the rare ones. He chats a lot of shit online, but he's actually really good. Like a lot of those dudes like, are really vocal online and you get, you know, politically active and are social justice warriors for better or worse, right? I usually kind of shit, in my personal opinion. I think they spend way too much time being politically active and a lot of time fucking playing. But Dave Clark, woo! He's fucking fire. Um, to to um to the best of his memory, in the red box of Dublin, he got a fake ID from a friend and wore an Oxford shirt to appear older. I remember it took me an hour to feel comfortable enough to dance, not even knowing how to dance. At this point, he was practicing his turntable skills in private. To be honest, I had really really bad taste in in my mouth about DJing in Dublin. Growing up, he says I felt like it was a weird, really competitive. The guys I grew up with DJing were more into scratching, which I fucking loved. Um, but I was more into dance music without sounding cliched. I was more into gaining an euphoric a notion. When I went to clubs, when I listened to certain records, the crescendos would always be the best bit. Um, at 19, Lennon was working at All City Records in Dublin, making tracks in his bedroom. The owner of the store wouldn't even entertain any of my demos while he'd listen to them. But I had the idea that if I listened to them something, he'd be listening to Declan, not listen to the track. And the change, um, and that changes the thing. So I decided I'd make an alias. I posted it on MySpace and say I'm from uh, Belize and I'm going to send free tracks to some influential people. The move paid off when BBC Radio, sorry, DJ Benji B picked up one of his tracks for his weekly show and played it for like three months, honest to God. The best bit was that a couple of peers from the record stop started talking about the track. I had to break the news to the owner and said, yeah, I made this, fuck off, he said, and then realised it and I never looked back since then. See, the power of a fucking alias, isn't it? They don't fucking give you any credit or give you any love when you use your real name because they know you for you and they can't take you for granted. The moment you give yourself a fucking alias and you say you're from some other place, right? And then suddenly now, you're fucking hot shit. Absolutely annoying, but I love it. It continues. Lennon was 25 when, you invite, when he was invited to play Parama Bar. 25! Fuck! Sick, man. Um, at Bergen in Berlin for the first time the infamous nightclub is open on Fridays night to the early Monday morning and the queue outside is long, slow and anxiety inducing. Bergen is renowned for the notoriously tough, the tough door policy imposing unsmiling balances that don't make it any easier. That might explain why he became so popular so quickly because his productions were so good so that might explain why the DJ career kind of popped off and he's been, you know, he still had a very stable career, you know, over the last, what, 10 or plus years, despite you know, some up and downs with, in terms of production, but the fact that he came out of the gate with, like, shithole production, probably kind of spoke to it, but big up him and obviously he still DJ super early on so he's very, very well rounded in that regard he says about his Bergheim experience, I was in my hotel awake all night with nerves I was chatting to a DJ, a friend of mine in Miami, about every variable. What if this track doesn't go down well? Well, if my folder of these songs and if it doesn't work, I was thinking of every backup plan. On this particular occasion, the club texted me and said, can you come in a taxi? He got the venue at 6 a.m. for his 8 a.m. set, but he wasn't quite sure what to do next. The queue was busy and I got in the queue because I was so anxious, I just didn't know what to do. I knew the ethos of the place. I was very nervous. I was pretty nervous. An hour passed and I was thinking, fucking hell, because the queue hadn't moved much. Imagine, man, how nervous you have to be to pull up to a burger and to go play your gig and you jump into a queue. You don't even try and go straight to the front and just try and get in because you're an artist fucking playing. Bloody hell, man. That must, that's something that I would do. I'd be so nervous just standing in the queue waiting when I actually should just be going in straight to the front. Uh, big up him. Thankfully, a record bag with him, which security guard spotted. He walked up to me and said, what are you doing? You can't bring this into the nightclub. I said, no, I'm DJing. He said, you're DJing here tonight? He said, yeah. The bouncers were laughing among themselves as he fought, as he brought me to the front of the queue and into the club. They were like, did you see this guy? He queued up. I was thinking this couldn't be going off to the worst start. For DJs and bouncers, Panama Bar on a Sunday is pretty much as good as it gets. But this was the only time... Um, that's, this is only the start that he describes as the wildest 36 hours of his life I did my set 
then had to leave straight away because I was asked to play Kate Moss's 40th birthday party in London. Can you imagine how much of a euphoric high that must be as a DJ? To go from playing Panorama Bar at 25 on a Sunday at 6am, prime slot, to flying out back to London to play Kate Moss's 40th. The fucking blow must have been flowing. The cat must have been flying. The pills must have been getting juggled. Loved it. Um, I did my set, then I had to leave straight away because I was playing, I was asked to play Kate Moss's 40th in London. I flew to Manchester to grab my suit, jumped on a suit, train to London, took a car to fellow DJ Screams Gaff, got dressed and went to Mayfair. Got to Screams Yard, couple of bumps, boom, straight to Kate Moss's. He then, he and Scream played back to back. Wow. Back then they were playing back to back. So Scream's been playing disco-ish stuff from a while, isn't it? Because I thought he only made that transition recently. Um, he and Scream played back to back until 4 a.m. after having one of the wildest parties ever. She they, then she, then she invited us back to her hotel, and she had a top floor at Claridge's, where we were there until 11 a.m. And I'm leaving out some very wild details. Oh, I'd love to if I ever met if I ever get to meet Crystal Clear, and we ever get to have a conversation. This is the one thing I want to hear about. Forget, oh, how do you get DJ bookings? How do you get a manager? Where do you record dig? How do you make your tunes? Now, fuck that. Tell me, off the record, what was Kate Moss's birthday party like? Please, in detail. Tell me in detail. Were you doing bumps off a of fucking Hermes plate? Did she have fucking Chanel straws? Like, what the fuck was going on there? Please tell me. Leave out the names. I don't really care about the names. But tell me about what was going on. Were they fucking monkeys? Was there a fucking giraffe in there? That's what I want to hear about. That's what I want to fucking hear about. The party wasn't over yet. He took a quick nap before playing at Boiler Room the set the later the day. Fucking hell. What a fucking lineup. Boiler Panorama Bar on a Sunday at 6 a.m. Kate Moss's 40th birthday party. And then a fucking Boiler Room rave. Fuck. In between that, you've got an after party at Claridge's. Shit. Um. It's under the sort of weekend that fantasist Jane in between her would make up to impress his mates. My behavior would have been like one of those in betweeners, he says. I was so wet around the ears. Wet, eh? I wonder what else was wet, mate. Uh, I was so wet around the ears in every aspect, but it really was insane. I could have written that script if I tried. Still, even after that weekend, you can't rest on your laurels. I was building my name for myself and things seemed to be going in the right direction. But honestly, this is the scary truth. At the drop of a hat at 27, things just started to stop. Damn. So imagine, that's the thing about DJing. It's so fucking up and down, right? You go from that heady high, two-year period of just like, ha, 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 ha. And then suddenly at 27, the gigs start to slow down because I guess, you know, DJing and club culture, because I, I remember reading a book about it. I wish I remember what book it was. When I was promoting, when I was doing the raves out here in Dawson in the Shoreditch and shit, and I was that man about town with my co-promoter that I was fucking doing the raves with, right? I remember reading an article about scenes, I think, back in the day. Maybe it was during, maybe it was about the scenes in New York and stuff. And I remember they said something like, scenes have a four-year cycle. So it's a four-year cycle of scenes where, you know, you all come in together, you're all doing raves, you're all doing parties, your mates are setting up bands, your mates are opening up bars, restaurants, agencies. And then there's another four-year cycle where another group of people come in. And usually that other four-year cycle replaces the other one. So you kind of have to move on, evolve, or you kind of get left behind type of thing. But it is a four-year cycle. And I imagine in nightlife, it's probably the same. And probably even worse so, even more so when it comes to DJs, because there's always the young, hot person, you know? You know? The young, hot person that needs to be there and out and about. Maybe that's all right, but I don't know. Let's continue. Let's hear what I have to say. Um, but honestly, this is the scary truth. At the drop of a hat, at 27, things just started to stop. My agent was like, gig offers aren't coming in. Remix offers aren't coming in. And I was starting to stress because you have this public persona and this was the heyday of social media where everyone was fluent in publicizing the brilliance of what they were doing and how amazing everything was. It just wasn't like that for me. And I was frankly shitting it. Can you imagine how that is as a DJ? You're not worried about your career. You're not worried about not being able to pay your bills. You're more worried about the perception that you look like a loser. The perception that you're dead. The perception that your career is dead in the water. 
you're more worried about how it looks like you don't have that that image on Instagram that says, oh, um, here's my gigs for February. Here's my gigs for March. Here's my gigs for April. You're more worried about not having that square. You're not worried. You're more worried about not having that picture with your arms open wide in the Jesus pose behind the DJ booth, as opposed to like my career is fucked up. How do I work something out? You're more more worried more so about the perception. That's the fucked up thing about social media, and I think probably everybody has the same sort of image. Has the same sort of thinking, especially in the creative world, in the in the arts, right, or in the entertainment field, which is why I love you know something that um. Tyler Creator said a lot about, you know, people, creatives should be posting more of the stuff that they do online, like things you're working on and really just, you know, sharing it all and not kind of being precious about what you do, not being a perfectionist. I think Virgil Abloh speaks about that sort of stuff quite often. That's really important because the perception thing doesn't really matter if you're really having fun with what you're doing. You feel like you're expressing yourself. You feel like you're being able to communicate, you know, communicate that with your quote unquote community or other people that are into the same thing that you're into, blah, 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 blah. But God damn, it continues. Things picked up, but the precariousness of the business is a pressure for DJs. The bigger problem with DJing is that the drugs, drinks, and hedonism, they all go hand in hand. I'm glad he said that. I'm glad he said that because that is a reality situation. They go hand in hand. They're unavoidable. You just have to work out what works for you. Whether it's like arriving at gigs at a certain times, so you don't have to, you know what I mean, you just got to work out, but there's no way of like getting rid of it. <clears throat> there's no way to stop in it. You just got to like figure out how to make it work for yourself. It's almost like, you know, figuring out how to pray in a brothel. You just got to work it out. You're not going to stop motherfuckers coming in. You're not going to stop motherfuckers coming. You just got to work out how to pray in a brothel. It fucking is what it is. It continues. Um, they all go hand in hand. If we're going to be black and white about it, most DJs that I know of course require that extra bit of confidence it's hard to it's hard to perform completely teetotal and i would agree with that 100 percent myself as being an avid raver as being an aspiring up and coming you know bedroom dj type it is quite difficult to dj or to rave without doing anything i've done it many a times i do it all the time to be completely honest when i do go out most of the time i am going out sober to be fair um with the exception of a red bull which i don't know if that counts with the caffeine and shit but it, it, you can do it but is it an is it an enjoyable experience is it pleasurable to be around drunk and high people when you're completely teetotal no but can you enjoy the sets can you like listen to somebody play like you're going to watch a gig yes but the the fucking drugs and the booze culture, it permeates. It's above you. You can't avoid it. It's almost like a cloud. It's a mist. It's all over you. People are touching you. Feel like it's just there. You go to the toilet to piss. You're hearing everybody sniffing all over the place. Like you can't avoid it. So it's just one of the things you have to kind of figure out how to make work for yourself. Whether it's like you come in straight away, you grab a fucking soft drink, you stand in the corner like a fucking fed and you don't go to the toilets and shit so you don't get tempted to do anything bad. You don't go to the bar at all. You just bring your own bottle of water. I don't know what you do. You have to figure out how it works for yourself but it is one of those things that it's just part of the, the thing and it's hard to kind of avoid. And I think the plain thing, I'm lucky with the plain thing. When it comes to DJing, I'm a fairly confident person anyway. Right? I'm a fairly confident person. So I don't need anything to kind of give me, you know, a push to kind of do something. I just do it because I want to do it. Um, I'm the singing, I'm the singing down the street type of guy that isn't drunk, right? I'm the guy on my bike that's like singing. <laughs> that isn't drunk or high. I'm just in a good mood. So I don't need any, like, I don't need something to give me a pick me up. Um, if anything, I actually don't like to do anything when I'm DJing. I don't want to drink. I don't want to do anything at all because I want to be like clear minded when I'm quote unquote performing. And I also feel like it's, you're kind of cheating the fans or the audience when you are under the influence when you're playing because you can't really do a good job clear minded. Because when you're at home, myself, you know, I don't know if it would be different, but when I'm at home and I'm putting together my sets or my playlist on record box and shit or I'm di record digging, I don't drink or smoke or do anything. I'm just like listening to tunes like, like oh my gosh, sick, 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 sick. And I'm reacting to it. And I'm putting it all into, into play. So I'm organizing my sets of what I want to play. So why can't I transpose that same sort of vibe into a club and give them my all there instead of trying to be under the influence and being all sloppy? I don't want to do that. And I'd rather save that stuff for after the set as a celebration. Okay, cool. Good job, mate. Well done. Here's a glass of champagne. You know what I mean, that's the way to do things, I think, personally. But I could be wrong. 
Lennon isn't teetotal, but he's fairly disciplined these days. I don't really party anymore, he says. I'm not a massive drinker when I DJ. I love a cigarette. That's probably a moment. Yeah, okay. I, 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 can, I can see that. A cigarette while I DJ probably might be a good little thing. Get that little nicotine hit or maybe hit the vape or some shit. That might be a quite a good way to go about things. Or maybe even a Zin. Maybe I wonder if there's a DJ. I wonder if there's DJs that get that get sponsored by Zin now. Maybe I might be the first DJ that gets a Zin sponsorship, right? I get like little nicotine patch was I'm fucking playing. That might be fucking sick. Now it's just reached a point where the touring schedule is so intense and then when tour ends, it's not like I'm going back to my bedroom to smoke a joint. I listen to Jeff Mills all day. I might go and finish a record. Just normal adulting. So, okay. So he's kind of changed and wised up a bit. I fucking love it. He's performed a lot of gigs sober, he says, and while he admits it's difficult, he thinks there are always there's ways to loosen social inhibitions without drugs and alcohol. If you do certain forms of therapy, it will bring that inner part of you out more that maybe you're not able to do without a drink. There is definitely a part of me when I'm sober with my friends, when I'm cracking the same jokes and <clears throat> having the same energy <clears throat> that I would after three or four pints. Exactly. If I'm the same though, I think I'm probably way more sloppy when I'm high and drunk, as opposed to when I'm sober. I think like when I'm sober, I'm, I'm the best version of myself in terms of like being fun <clears throat> and having a good vibes. Sorry. But I remember I went to Bergheim three times, I think. Yeah, three times sober. And I think two of the times was during Sober October. I happened to be there during Sober October and I happened to like, you know, I've kind of followed through with it. And one thing I've noticed is that I think being sober in clubs is easier when the club is like, a level of like Bergheim, that kind of level of way, like so they take clubbing seriously, there's door picking there, there's a lot of like chin strokers and music heads that go there, so you don't feel as if like everybody around you is fucked up, there are people that are fucked up, don't get me wrong, but not everybody's out there to go, to go get fucked up and to have the best time of their life and make it like a fucking Project X party, no, people are there to see DJs, they're there to maybe see friends, they might be there to kind of quote unquote cruise, it's not just straight up drinking and drugs but i feel like most clubs especially the clubs in london they are just an excuse for people to get fucked unfortunately so it makes it harder to kind of like be sober and do it well because everybody in there is kind of just using the clubs using the djs using the party as a conduit as an excuse to get fucked up right because why not get fucked up with the soundtrack on but i feel like if you go places like Berkheim and other you know established legit clubs maybe run properly People in there aren't just there to get fucked up. They're there to hang. They're there to chill, listen to music, you know, maybe um, get inspiration for their sets themselves or whatever else they do in their lives. People watch, just hang out, whatever. So that's what makes it a bit easier in those type of places, I found. Again, it's weird to say this, but I find it easier to be sober in a place like Bergheim than to be sober in a place like Fabric, for instance, in my personal opinion. But again, I could be wrong. Lennon says that he had time to reflect during the months after his nervous breakdown. He took some time out, but he felt uninspired to make music. I started to resent my job, resent my industry. I started to hate the fact that something I love lost me someone I love and also made me feel this way about my body and about my health. Yeah, because I'd imagine now the same time that he did the whores, isn't it? Because again, not, you know, not to be mean or anything, but he was looking super fat in that, you know, a few of those whore uh berlin vlogs that he was doing his tits were flying all over the place so maybe that was kind of a consequence of like you know the shitty lifestyle feeling a bit down not really kind of like you know not really loving what you're doing and kind of like you know comfort eating and shit that kind of it takes its toll but again I, it kind of i remember that being a thing that i was very conscious and aware of um you know for the dj career that i'm kind of you know striving to uh, achieve was when i remember watching like seth chocolate's ascent because i remember seth chocolate at the time was dating a girl that I kind of knew loosely and they ended up getting engaged. I kind of knew her from the scene and shit, right? And then I remember, like, they obviously had to break off the engagement and I remember hearing through, through people that part of it was his lifestyle. He was never around and shit and when he was around, cooling, there'd be loads of people behind in the back. You know, Seth Shocks, for instance, he's fucking, you know, world-famous DJ. There'd be tons of people in the background talking, all this sort of shit. So you just, you just imagine from her point of view how it would have felt like you were kind of on your own when your partner was flying off around the world and you go and call him and it's almost like you never have alone time. You can never be together, you know? It's almost like there's always someone else in the room, some clout chaser, some fucking flute, some fucking whore, right? Some groupie trying to like jump on your guy. And over time, that's a kind of break up. And I remember he even said himself, I think during an interview with RA, he was really heartbroken. 
because he really loved that girl. That girl really loved him, but it just didn't work out. So you can only imagine, you know, what that must feel like, especially when you're a DJ. You know, you kind of meet somebody, you get engaged because you feel like this is one person that kind of gets you and you, I want to, you want to hold them down. You're looking to, you know, build a life together with them, whatever. And then suddenly it ends because of the same job that you had. It must be fucking horrible. Um, but yeah, it kind of is part of the process of it and whatever you can do. Let's continue. Still as an artist, he felt the need to express himself. He started putting together a book of photography, more of a personal project. When he told his friends, a French publisher, about it, he suggested that he released a photo memoir, Building Walls Out of Paper, is a result. It's all ups and downs, he says. The surrounding message is, uh, is never assumed. Photography and writing mark something new direction of Lennon, who now wants to explore different types of artistic expression. Ah, you see? Okay, I like this. I like this. He's like, you know what? I'm not losing another fucking fiance. I'm not losing another wife. I'm not losing another girlfriend. I'm not losing another partner because it's fucking the career. So if you can have a little side career, being a writer, a photographer and shit, that also pays the bills, that also allows you to be artistically, you know, expressive and shit, he'll take it. I like this approach. I like this. He's like, you know what? You're not burning me twice. I do circumstances. I do circumstantially believe that everything happens for a reason. I needed to burn out to happen in July because you don't learn anything by success. You learn by failure. Agreed. Big up, crystal clear. Very much agree with that. You don't learn anything by success. Unfortunately, I don't know why we're hardwired like that as, as humans. We're wired not to learn by our wins, but by our losses. Tense, you know, you have to kind of always burn our hands to fucking learn to put our fucking hand in the fucking stove. It's annoying, but it is what it is. It continues. It's not that I failed, but I learned from a tough situation. Building Walls Without Paper is published by Classic Paris and Toll Tonic and available online. I hope he does a fucking, um, what you call it, exhibition in London. I know he did one in Ireland with the pictures and shit. Hopefully he does an exhibition and reading in, in London sometime soon. I think that'll fucking go off and shit, especially considering his connection with London and Phonica Records and all that kind of good stuff. That'll definitely be something good to check out. But really good article, to be honest. Very honest, um, very upfront about his struggles. Again, I think sometimes the DJ moaning about the gigs can be a little bit self-indulgent, especially considering the amount of people out there that would fucking kill to be crystal clear. Even during his worst months, right? They fucking kill to have that career. I still think it's, you know, it's probably nice still to share that anyway and to let people know that despite what you may think, not all that glitters is gold and that sometimes having this sort of life, you have to sacrifice other things such as your career, such as your, sorry, such as your family, such as your personal and whatever else you may be. But a really, really good article. Big up the Irish Independent for putting together. Big up Crystal Clear for being open and vulnerable about everything. And of course, big up the writer, Katie Byron, for obviously being able to pen this lovely, lovely, lovely article and I hope you guys can read it yourself if you want to do so. I'll obviously put the link in the description for you to check it out if that is the way that you feel, if that is the way that you feel.